I would like to welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Dave Castles, president of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform. I am particularly pleased, I must say, with the excellent turnout today. And I want to express my personal appreciation to our moderator and four speakers who have given up their time to support our coalition and our important work. To open, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. An important step in reconciliation is our acknowledgement of traditional land. In the best interest of time, I would now like to introduce and thank our moderator, Mr. Mubin Sheikh. Mubin is an active member of the Coalition for Canadian Police Reform and serves on our board of directors. He is a professor at the School of Public Safety at Seneca College. He is a unique individual. Mubin is a counter extremism specialist and also a counter terrorism specialist. I must welcome you, Mubin, and thank you for moderating our webinar today and, of course, for introducing our speakers. Mubin? Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, we're trying to keep this on track. Uh, I know everyone is busy. We all have our things to do. Get home, get away from home, get away from work, whatever it is. Uh, I really want this to be as uh, conversational as possible. The speakers will um, give their, their spiel, so to speak. Some of them have some slides, and so they'll take us uh, through their slides. But really, uh, I'm doing this wrong if I'm doing more of the speaking. Uh, and so I will try uh, the Herculean task that it is to keep me quiet. Uh, we'll make sure that the speakers uh, have their time and really just want is, want this to to have uh, be as much of a back and forth as possible, more conversational than you know the usual top down death by PowerPoint. Let's try to avoid that. Uh, what I'll do is uh, we kind of agreed on the speaker's uh, order. Uh, I just went uh, alphabetically by the last name. Um, so you can thank your parents for that. Um, and actually, I wanted the speakers to introduce themselves. I know, I think there's some bios uh, that circulated for the attendees. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, speakers, usually they, they have their own uh, thing that they want to do. So uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll punt it over to Randall Arsenal. Uh, to kick it off, if that's okay, friend. That is absolutely okay. I'm first to go with my spiel. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's uh, it's certainly a pleasure uh, to be here, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak to you all. I I certainly believe in police reform, and that's one of the reasons why I'm why I'm here right now. Uh, so again, my name is Randy Arsenault. Uh, I recently retired after a 20 year career with Toronto Police. Uh, currently, I manage the Indigenous Spirit Fund, which is a fund for First Nations, Métis and Inuit children, youth and their families. That's sponsored by Native Child and Family Services of Toronto, which is an organization that I've actually volunteered with for about 25 years now. Uh, uh, just before, uh, I just want to say, I, I'm just going to kind of talk for maybe 15 minutes and give some examples. I had some slides and maybe a PowerPoint, but what I'm going to say now is, can actually be, uh, it, it's qu quite often, it's a two day course. So I'm just really compressing a lot of things. So I appreciate what Move and Shake about. This is just gonna be more of a conversation. So uh, I'm happy to start that conversation and hopefully we can keep it going with questions and answers and, and even after this, uh, after this event here. So uh, currently I'm working with police services and organizations, uh, both in the public and the private sector not just in North America, but of course around the world now with uh, ever since the, uh, uh, what took place with COVID and such, we've certainly, you know, open communication channels around the world. And I talk about uh, effective use uh, of technology, effective communication strategies, how to get a message across to the public, but more importantly, how to figure out what the message is that you're trying to get across to the public, because most people struggle with that. Even if they have a strategy in place, they struggle with what the message is going to be. And uh, something important is I, I come from a police family and I've been to exposed to uh, police and police culture my entire life. My father was a police officer for Toronto Police. He spent most of his time uh, in, in with the emergency task force on the gun team. And as I, you know, I kind of watched, uh, I watched him as I was growing up. My older brother became a police officer. Then my younger brother became a police officer. Then I became a police officer. And then my other younger brother became a police officer. So out of five boys, four, four of us became police officers. 
And, you know, certainly growing up, my father, his friends were cops and their sons and daughters wanted to be police officers. So, uh, I, again, I've, I've, I'm 48 years old now. And uh, I, w when it comes to police culture, I think I can maybe speak with, with uh, a little bit of intelligence when it comes to police culture. I've certainly been exposed to it my uh, in, entire life and I have an understanding of it. Uh, you know, and I saw the good side of police culture, which is the, the camaraderie. Uh, the brotherhood, as it used to be referred to as a brotherhood, which is now, of course, uh, referred to as, you know, a family. And basically, it just means there's a sense of, be of belonging. But I've also been uh, exposed to the negative side of police culture. Again, growing up, if not in my in my personal life, then through through, you know, what I've seen in, in with my father's friends and such the depression, the substance abuse, uh, domestic violence, and even some of the suicide. And I think that's kind of why I decided to take a different approach when I did decide to get into the policing. At the end of my dad's career, he transferred to the Aboriginal Peacekeeping Unit out of Toronto Police. And that was kind of the first time I saw my dad in in a com in a community policing role and even the term community policing wasn't used all that often back then but that was the first time i really saw him from that you know again the emergency task force which is the adrenaline and and uh you know the guys jumping out of the back of the trucks to now a community policing um uh, model and and again i just it really kind of appealed to me uh this of course, his background in policing, uh, it's kind of shaped ultimately how I wanted to be a police officer. And and it, it certainly shaped how I acted as a police officer, some of the some of the choices I would make. Long story, but it led to me uh, eventually holding the title of community engagement officer. Uh, CEO. I like to say CEO because it makes me feel really important. And when that time came, when I held that role, I was actually the first community engagement officer in Canada. And it basically, the position was a blank sheet of paper, but I had certain duties. Build bridges, uh, break down barriers, develop meaningful relationships with the community, all the code phrases that they basically teach new recruits to say, but that actually work if you put them into practice. Uh, officers certainly have uh, many tools available, and uh, one of the tools that I used in that position was social media. And I took the same approach to social media as I did as a community engagement officer, which was I was very open, uh, honest with my interactions as you should be, and I, and I certainly thought outside the box. So my direct supervisors uh, became believers in social media, or effective use of social media, I should say, after we put on an event at a school in Scarborough, it was called Don't Be Fooled. And it was about online safety for, for youth. And that event, Don't Be Fooled, which was filmed in a, in a cafeteria in Scarborough, we trended uh, in the top 10 in Canada for over four hours, um, which was you know something we're very, very proud of. And that was kind of the first time we really, we, we saw the reach of social media and the message that we were trying to get across. Uh, you know, part of thinking outside the box uh, means pushing boundaries. And I've certainly have not been afraid to push boundaries over the course of my career and duties and continue to do so. And, you know, I'm just going to go off topic for a minute, but that kind of reminds me of my first viral post. I'll start by saying there's many, many officers that were before me that have used social media and have fantastic accounts. Great off. I just want to share my experiences. Those experiences are there, are theirs, and that's for their, them to share. But my first personal post was a photo of a stormtrooper helmet, me in a stormtrooper helmet. I was a school resource officer at the time, and uh, I dealt with a lot of the youth. I had a great relationship with um, uh, with a lot of the youth there, and they all knew I was a Star Wars fan because of just my interactions. And towards the end of the year, as school was closing, they they got together and they bought me a stormtrooper helmet, and they brought it to me in my office at uh, at the school. And I was in uniform. I put it on, and I took a picture of myself and I uploaded that. And I got to say, within five minutes, I started getting the calls from communications headquarters. Uh, you know take it down. It's not professional. You're in uniform. And what kind of message are you sending across to the public? What does that have to do with public safety? Okay, everything else. Well, listen, I didn't take it down. Okay, they gave me the choice. And I chose not to take it down. And to me, I was kind of glad I didn't because that was, 
uh, you know, you talk about, again, community policing and community engagement. That showed, to me, that was proof that it doesn't get any more real than that. I mean, the students brought me something out of the goodness of their own hearts, and I put it up there, and I, it was just fantastic to have that story. And and of course, nowadays they have uh, they have you know police officers who that that's basically the branding Star Wars and and all kinds of other different characters. So, if I've been successful online, to get back into it, if I've been successful online, it's because well, a my supervisors who have believed in 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 uh, in what I was doing out there and got behind me. But it's also because I, I worked hard to show the human side of policing and allowed myself to be vulnerable, which, of course, is very, very hard for police officers to do. And rightfully so, uh, historically. Uh, I use the phrase showing personality without getting personal. So if you know me online, you'll know that that I have a three legged German shepherd. You know that I have chickens. I chop wood on the weekends. Uh, but what you don't know and I, that I live in the country, but what you don't know is you don't know where I live. You don't know what I drive. You don't know my family or my relationship status. Uh, again, so I, I let people into my life without getting too personal. Uh, I allowed them to connect with me on a personal level while, while still keeping barriers, which is, of course, very important. Uh, the people connected, people are connected to people. People are not connected to symbols. Uh, I had my my police crest my you know withdrawal police service uh that would be on my accounts but people are not attracted to your badge or your crest they're attracted to the person behind that badge or behind that service and I, that's just kind of one of the messages i i try to get across uh but because of that personality when the time came to get a message across from the public, an important message across to the public, there was a certain level of trust where people wanted to, uh, they felt like they were helping out a friend, someone that they knew, instead of just helping helping a police service or the police department. Um, I'm going to give an example about that now. Forgive me, I tell stories. I'm a storyteller. It's in my LinkedIn profile. And I think people learn through stories. Uh, the first time that, again, as a service, my supervisors, even myself, we really see, saw this work in action. We went, uh, uh, in Scarborough, there was a missing person. It was a missing five-year-old on one of the first days of school. And I showed up at that call and started tweeting. I wasn't dispatched to it. I was at for another school, but I showed up and I started tweeting. I came up with a hashtag right away. I would put out information such as the description of the kid, what they were last seen wearing, um, area, the bus route, we had canines show up. Uh, every major news station eventually got on board and started putting out this information because they saw they wanted to be part of what was taking place. When the canines showed up, I'm talking about what attracts people. People really wanted to feel like they were in the moment. And I was live tweeting the entire event. So when canines showed up, I would take a picture of the dog and put it out there because people love animals and they just love the fact that there was now the dog looking on scene. We had the trucks come in for the incident, you know, major incident come in. I took a photo of the vehicles. We put that out there. People really felt because they were, they were actually in the moment uh, with, with police. One thing that was kind of funny about that, when the scene commander showed up, just kind of what did a round table talking about what everybody was doing. And uh, when it came to me, I said, what are you doing? I'm just putting the information out there right off the bat. Nothing goes out unless you run it by communications first. And then right off to the, went to the next person. Now, I don't fault him for this at all, because again, historically, uh, we're, police are very, very careful about the information that they put out and they want to control the narrative, which of, of course has to be done. Thank goodness I had a uh, one of my supervisors just kind of saw or my inspector saw and just kind of waved them off like, okay, keep doing what you're doing because they just genuinely, this incident commander just didn't understand the effects of social media and what was actually taking place. We looked at analytics afterwards uh, and we reached over 1 million people. Uh, one Over 1 million people were was were getting the information that, that I was putting out with my BlackBerry device. And that again was a huge success story. Um, not just for me, but just, uh, again, effective use of social media. Uh, I understand that the narrative does need to be controlled. Uh, I'll be the first to admit, admit that many officers on life, online have certainly embarrassed themselves and the service. 
and you know you have to be careful of of uh, who's doing what and i'll get into that in a second i don't think every officer should be on social media in fact i would say that most officers should not uh, be online including new police officers officers who are looking to join in certain squads where they may want to work plain clothes undercover and such although the fact that uh, media and everything seems to be put online including graduation ceremonies with ai these days it's going to be very tough not to identify police officers um uh, you know when when somebody's showing up at at your door even through live video cam footage whatever the case is uh, a public profile it suited my position at the time as community engagement officer but it certainly does not uh, it doesn't suit every every position so one important one important distinction is police officers police departments i should say they hire social media officers okay i was not a social media officer i was an officer who used social media and there's a very big difference between the two a social media officer may uh, stay at communications or sit behind a desk and try to engage and put out public information. I was an officer who was on the ground, boots on the ground, uh, and developing these relationships. And, and again, people feel felt like they were connecting with me on a personal level because they were. Uh, again, I could have, uh, I, I, I gave some examples about having a, a strong presence on social media and how it was effective. But the most common theme of effective social media use is that in order to truly connect with the community, you need to develop a strong level of trust. And it requires shown personality. And historically, again, that was very frowned upon, frowned upon by uh, police services. I could give more examples uh, of attending calls, whether it's a bar fight, uh, a car meet, et cetera or having a strong social media presence was a good thing, but I can't give one example when having a strong presence worked against me or it worked against other police officers. And I've, uh, I, again, I attended radio calls where it was a bad situation. It was a bad situation going in. I'm talking about a bar fight during the, the Raptors playoffs in Toronto where, uh, you know, the fights were spilling out onto the streets and, and we showed up and there was instant recognition because of social media and the crowd that was really kind of jacked up, they went from, they went from high to low pretty quick because again, they felt like they, uh, they felt like they had a relationship, uh, uh, with the officers that were showing up. So not too long ago i spoke with the chief of a, a smaller police service whatever smaller police service is toronto was 5500 so anything smaller than that is a smaller police service but he was having uh an issue this this police of the service there was a lot of uh officers looking to retire and what was happening was the newer officers that were being hired were taken on the attitude of some of the of the experience officers which was they didn't really want to do too much they were sitting in the car most of the shift uh you know again this is his experience as, a, as police chief this is what he was telling me so he the the issue with the chief was how to get these new officers out there and not take on this on on you know the personality of the coach officers which of course happens so often and uh what uh, he wanted at the time he wanted an officer that could uh, that would come to the service and perhaps have uh, be new enough that some of the the newer officers or the younger officers could look up to this person and and say no no i i want to be like that i want I, I, that person there when i get out of the car i want to talk to people but also somebody that the that wasn't afraid to stand up to the older officers if that makes sense or, or the more experienced officers i should say uh, and i i was talking the example I gave him, because I'm aware of this town, was they have a, a, a beautiful pier where where there's all kinds of car meets, new car meets, old old cars. They were always going out in a pier. And I would go to that town sometimes, and it was a beautiful little town. I'd walk the pier, I'd walk the beaches, and you could see the cops waiting at the end of the pier to give tickets, maybe for exhaust being too loud, somebody wanted to squeal the tires, whatever the case was, right? That that That's what they were waiting to do. And to me, I've always felt that was kind of demeaning. So what my advice to the chief was, or if what I would do if I was there, uh, 
listen, this these this service they use the chargers. They use the Dodge Chargers. People like those cars. They're cool looking. These are these are car meets. My advice: take the car to the car wash, get it looking good, drive out to the pier, get out of the car, open the hood, let them check out the engine, whatever the case is. Introduce yourself, have a conversation with them. When you when when you get to know people by name or or when people get to know you by name there's a level of respect that comes with that and it didn't and it it doesn't take too long for word to get around and for, and you know again i could talk about stats and analytics but when there's a level of respect it really makes a difference in not just in crime but how people are dealing with the police uh other police officers that show up to these calls what i'm talking about now is nothing new okay uh sir robert peel who of course every every police service wants to uh talk about how they uh, you know they, they get their instructions from he he was talking about these things 200 years ago okay what i would but the but some of the officers think it's groundbreaking right they, they see that as groundbreaking I, I would never have thought about that get out of the car drive to the end of the pier instead of going through a tim horton's drive through park the car get out of the car go inside the store there's always a group of retirees that are sitting there that want to say a funny joke to the cops there's always some you know some school kids that may say some funny joke whatever the case is you can take your photo with them that's community engagement right there it's just getting out of the car it's not groundbreaking it's as simple as getting out of the car going and grabbing a coffee instead of going through drive through uh, officers now uh, again i'm going to end this really quick because i'm kind of going a long time here officers need to pay attention to new and upcoming trends uh and not just jump on the the bandwagon afterwards i'm going to john are you able to play a quick video i i wasn't going to bother but if you could just play a quick video and then i'll talk about this video a bit and then i'm going to end it off <laughs> it's an example If you're Randy, able. the first try failed. Just stand by for another try. No problem. It's only it's a 10 second TikTok video. I hope it's uh, I hope it uh, will play for it. But... Oh, I think we'll get it this time. Sure. You want to replay? Yeah, replay that once. Why not? <laughs> oh. Okay, so listen, I know that that looks ridiculous, okay? I know that's ridiculous. There's a bit of a backstory and I'll just kind of explain what it was and I'll, I'll explain the, the effects of it. Uh, I was sitting in a parking lot. It was, I think that was about one or two in the morning. I was sitting in a parking lot on lunch and my partner's actually in the vehicle. You can't see him there. And a bunch of youth in Scarborough uh, who recognized myself and my partner from, from TikTok and such they saw us and they wanted to shoot a video. So I basically said, okay, give me a second. Let's figure, you know, figure something out there. We shot that video. I'm sitting there in a car, the guy gets on, it was still during COVID, everybody had to wear the mask. So he acts like he's on his phone there and he gets in and then it, I get out, I'm looking all confused. I know that's ridiculous. And of course I was waiting for, you know, maybe the email and such the next day. Okay, Randy, what is this? What are you putting out there? Okay, I'll tell you what I'm putting out there. I'm putting out a safety message. Number one, if you're, in, you're sitting in your car in a parking lot, you make sure your doors are locked. Number two, double check your ride sharing programs like Uber before you get into it because people are getting into the wrong vehicles and they're being killed in the States. This is happening. Number three, don't be staring down at your phone. Situational awareness. There's three important safety messages in a 10 second video. It's ridiculous, but it makes sense. And when I explain that, they, Okay, you know what, Randy? Yeah, you're actually onto something. It does make sense. Of course, it's hard to explain that in, you know, what you got 40 characters or something like that on TikTok for you to write that down. It's hard to explain, but people get it. And uh, anyways, I just wanted to kind of throw that as an example of a ridiculous video, but there's still a message behind it and you can still talk, you can get that message out in a, in a fun way. And uh, during a scheduled lunch hour, and in your memo book you're on a scheduled lunch hour if they were to look at the so you're not really doing anything wrong 
you're you're in the community having your lunch you can you can go behind a building it doesn't matter i just a and w was open so of course we're sitting there having our uh, having our lunch here so people will two more points i just want to uh show throw out there really quickly you cannot mandate somebody to to use social media you can't mandate an officer to use social media if it's part of the job de description the officer has to want that okay and understand the expectations that it's part of the job description it's not just showing up at events we have too many cups it may sound hypocritical coming to me but there's too many cops out there showing up at events taking photos taking selfies put them up on social media and look at us and look at what we're doing people see through that the public see through that they know what's fake and you know who knows what's fake kids know what's fake youth know what's fake fake if i was successful as an officer a very important point it's because yeah i was i was in a social media officer i was an officer that used social media but i was also boots on the ground i answered radio calls i was there in the community i worked with the community i cried with the community and i left myself vulnerable which is very important i know it's tough to do very important um listen good luck to you all i really i i wish i wish i had more time to talk i can talk forever uh good luck to whether you're in you're creating procedures or or you're looking at strategies uh i'm happy i'll be sticking around i'm happy to answer any questions you have thank you very much by the way <laughs> right on randall fantastic we gotta somehow make a put this into a booklet or something or some kind of uh textbook that i don't know it will get it'll, it'll end up at the police college or something um, I had a bunch of uh, points I wanted to make just in, in, in summary of your of your talk and I won't spend too much time on I'll just throw out some topics uh, just for everyone to kind of ponder on but I really liked uh, the one note I put here is balancing the needs of public communications and officer privacy and uh, you gave some good points there about um, not just the you know what's fake and what's not but um, you know posting messages or posting photos of like graduation ceremonies or others where like people are just starting off they might want to go into something covert so there is a um, awareness part to that of course but um but that's something to ponder over um i liked your in the moment and by the way i guess they found the girl yes they did they absolutely did yeah. okay <laughs> yeah because yeah, that story would not be good if you were telling how you know great yeah. you were at the scene and yeah. you didn't find her okay no i left you hanging there <laughs> yeah but yeah. uh, I like what you said there in the moment. And um, and I just thought to myself as an outsider and just a consumer of police services, uh, it, it really does give a pu the public a sense of ownership and and presence, you know, when when these sorts of things are happening. So we'll leave that. And the last point I had here was statistics versus intangibles. Right. I mean, yes, you know, we, we can talk about the statistics based approach that police organizations ended up doing. Maybe this is something that Rick can speak to. Um, just how a lot of this uh, statistic-based measurements came into police services. Um, but it's that intangible stuff, right? The public perception of police and how the police are doing. And it really does feed back into that um, Peel's principles of policing, uh, which, I mean, it's still, yeah, it's considered groundbreaking. And yet, these, you know, this was written like hundreds of years ago. So uh, there's a real gap, I think, between theory and practice. And so maybe that's another point for people to kind of think about. Um, what I'm going to do is kick it over to uh, Dave Ilanik. Uh, Dave, take it away for us, please. Uh, thank you very much, Mobin and Randy. That was uh, just amazing. That's a pretty tough act to follow. So you know what? But what really resonated on me in my policing career, I like says uh, I was an inspector in downtown division. And what we really wanted to just was really enhance uh, the community engagement piece and telling members to actually get out of their cars, like we basically assign them a one or two block geographical radius, get out of the car and actually engage with the community. You know, and at first, because it was very much something new and foreign, it wasn't well received, but I can tell you, it didn't take very long until members really started to see how much the community uh, really appreciated those efforts and how it really engaged them so much more. So yeah, great, great job, Randy. So I'm just going to pull up a presentation I have here. Uh, it is a PowerPoint. I'm not going like, to kill you with a number of slides. Uh, the reason I have a PowerPoint for this a presentation because I just kind of want to provide you kind of uh, basically how we approach this project that I'm going to speak with. And certainly, like I said, at the end, I'd love to hear your feedback, any questions that you have. 
and definitely willing to help any agency kind of go down this path if you feel that it's worthwhile. So I'm just going to share my presentation here with me right now. So just bear with me. So can everybody see that all right? Looks good, Dave. Okay, thanks, John. So the, what I'm gonna speak today about here is what is called is an integrated call evaluation and dispatch project. So the name itself really is unreflective of what this project really encompasses. So just a little bit to start out about myself. So I've been with Edmonton Police Service now for over 35 years. Uh, 25 years as a sworn member, retired in 2013 as an inspector, uh, worked primarily in operational organized crime intelligence, but well, he says most of it was on the front line engaged in community. So I stayed on with Edmonton Police Service upon retiring. I stayed on in a number of management and then kind of leadership roles. And over the past couple of years, or two or three years, I've had the very good fortune of performing kind of a number of operational reviews of areas within our service to really look at ways where we could really start to engage community more and how we could be more effective. So I can truly say that this project to me is probably one of the greatest ones that I've ever worked on. It's the most rewarding. And the reason for that is, is because I truly believe that this is a real game changer in terms of how we can really make a difference in people's lives while contributing to enhance public safety as well. So, so my presentation today, uh, it's really, it's about creating a new service delivery model. And definitely that is differently how police respond to calls for service, particularly involving mental illness, addictions and houselessness. But this is really about an agency and bringing everybody together and a truly enhanced partnership in, de in developing a new 24 seven service delivery model that's really focused on sharing information, working together so that we're really working towards improved individual outcomes, which is very, very important because you'll see here, everything starts with a call for service or with an initial contact with an individual. And I truly believe is that each one of those opportunities provides us with an opportunity to make meaningful change in people's lives. And as I look back now, obviously in my policing career and all the opportunities that were lost and that had we connected people with the right resources early on when they were just in need or and before they came in crisis. So as part of this project, I've really kind of identified really that basically really simply is that Quite honestly, there are two groups of people. There are really people in need. So those are ones that are just beginning to have some struggles in life. So that could be the beginnings of addictions or they need some type of other support. You know what? And if those basic needs and those people aren't connected with the resources that they need, then they become in crisis. And then crisis then really results then, you know what, in the addictions, in the houselessness, in the poverty, and then becoming very vulnerable. So that's why I really focus on that. If we can deal with people's when and when they're just in need versus when they're in crisis, I think that we'll have much more success. So in creating this, I was very fortunate to have a great project manager come on board earlier this year. So one of the key things that we really needed to do was to create a vision for this project. And really what we came with is the right response at the right time equals improved individual outcomes and enhanced community safety. So too often the not as we're well aware is that quite often this has truly kind of been the de facto of a police response to many calls for service involving mental illness, addictions, houselessness, poverty. And what we're truly starting to see more and more is that that response, you know, what well, well intended does not always result in the best individual outcomes or even enhanced community safety. So this was really about, this is not just about building a facility. This is really about delivering a new 24 seven service delivery model that really looks at that. So really looking at that, what is the right response at the right time? 
So there's been a lot of discussion kind of around this, you know, and obviously of incidents that have occurred in the world over the recent number of years about what is that right response? Is that right response mental health workers responding? And we look at this very much kind of from a different perspective is that quite often the most or the best outcome that you can achieve is through a partnered response where everybody has a particular role and basically then in helping with those individual outcomes and enhance community safety. And that like says is easier said than done, but that's really like says where we're created a mission for this and everything that we're doing kind of around this project is really focused on that vision is the right response at the right time. And this goes way beyond that initial response because uh, that initial response often is quite difficult to determine. It's usually based on just a few minutes at best of information received by a police communications area or any other kind of emergency communications area. And it's very difficult to determine what that right response may be. Yes, there definitely are opportunities when we can do that, but more so the right response is when your first responders, you know, go to that call, your social workers, your outreach workers, go to those calls and are able to do that assessment and able to make that assessment then about, okay, what does that individual need right now, but what also they do need in future in terms, you know, at, of supports, of long-term assistance, and really getting, adopting a case management kind of approach to improving individual outcomes, which you'll see a little bit later on in my presentation. So really the project driver. So why did we decide that we needed to do this in Edmonton and kind of take this on? Because there really was no template for this type of integrated approach kind of of this magnitude. So kind of throughout Canada and the US now, we've seen much more mental health workers being integrated into police communication areas, but we think this needs to go far beyond that. So really looking at this, we looked at okay, what are the need, what are the true project drivers? Why are we doing this type of work? So first and foremost, one of the problems is truly a lack of a streamlined call intake process or approach. What I mean by that now is that there are so many different numbers that the public can call from 911, police non-emergency lines, 211, 311, 811, you know, and in the fall there'll be 9988 for mental health support. So quite often the public is really confused. So that was kind of one of the key things that we needed to look at is developing a real streamlined call intake process so that regardless of the number you call, that people are getting the, the support and the help that they need and they're not just referred to other agencies and going, that's kind of not my problem, call this number. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want people to have to repeat their stories because often if you've been victimized, that just means that you're being re-victimized every time you have to tell that story. So this was really one of the key needs for this. Really the lack of coordinated response to both emergent and non-emergent calls for service. I think we've all seen examples and things like that where that partnered response really truly is the best response. And like I mentioned, each agency having very important critical roles in resolving those situations at different times, you know, and so we're really looking at that successful conclusion. Uh, lack of multi-agency call evaluation. Here again, this is really a problem because this is kind of what I spoke about. When the public can call one number, you know, at, and you don't have agencies working together in a partnered approach to call evaluation, which is very critical then to determining what is that right resource to respond. Lack of situational awareness. So this is really important. Obviously, at least is when you're looking at your high priority calls, high incident calls, and that uh, you're kind of your frontline responders not sharing information. And obviously we know like there's several examples of where we see where that doesn't happen, that doesn't result in good outcomes for public safety as a whole. You know what? Obviously we're seeing more and more increased calls for service of all mental illness, addictions, and houselessness. And really, like says, so how can we do better at that? We know these calls are increasing or are continuing to increase. So that's probably a little bit indicative too, is that maybe past approaches really aren't solving those problems. So what does that look like to be different? The next one is really key and is probably one of the most difficult ones and one we're really focused on is the lack of a multi-agency data sharing and case management model. 
So where this is really a problem is that there's many great agencies, public, not-for-profit agencies that are involved and truly want to improve individual outcomes for people. But the problem is we don't share basic information. So I'll give you an example of that. For example, a police agency, you know, it can maybe have dealt with an individual for social disorder eight times in a month. You know, within that same city or town or whatever it may be, a crisis diversion or a crisis response team may have dealt with that individual an equal amount of times or even more. But the problem is those systems don't talk to each other and quite often sometimes the agencies don't talk to each other. So when you're truly looking at identifying people that are most in crisis, you don't have that big picture. So how I equate it is everybody kind of has a wallet size picture, but we're missing that eight by 10 picture so that we could truly identify people early on that are truly in crisis and that need that support. And right now we're kind of doing it in a siloed approach. And this is really then about reconnecting people in need with the resources that they need. So, so many agencies now, all out of good intent, are referring then individuals to obviously, you know, to support agencies, not recognizing that probably many of these individuals have already connected with these agencies, but it's about a reconnection, not a new connection. So it's really about, you know, doing that reconnection, not creating yet another referral that doesn't get followed up. And part of this too, a little later on I'll talk about is the importance of a timely follow-up in terms of what stabilization will probably look like in the future. So, and this says really the last part of this is, you know, is lack of shared call pathways and technologies between agencies that just contributes to that problem where I talked about is that we're not sharing information very effectively in a timely manner. So very simply at a high level, the project goals in that for this project are that development of a streamlined and partnered approach to call intake. So that's really ensuring then that regardless of the number that Edmontonians call, that they're gonna get the support and the service that they need. They're it's gonna be, they're not gonna have to repeat their story. So yes, there's process change, call pathing change, technology changes that need to occur. That's really is one of the primary goals of this project. The second one is the development of a 24-7 outcomes-based partner approach to the whole call intake evaluation dispatch and response that will ensure the right resources are not only dispatched at that initial call for service, but the proper assessments are made and the proper follow-up is done to ensure then that individuals then are receiving that long-term care that they need. And that's very much needs to be based on a peer support on a lived experience type of follow-up case management model. So we are engaging agencies like CMHA to take a role into that too. And they've been a very good partner here at Edmonton and really looking then at what would that follow-up really look like and that sustained follow-up to you get people to a point then of sustainability. Uh, the last one, we're assisting in this part. This is obviously something that needs to be owned by community, not by a police agency is that development of a multi-agency data sharing and case management model so that you can truly get an idea where, you're, where all your frontline workers then would know when they're dealing with an individual is that this individual, like says, is already connected with a certain agency and it's about quite often reconnecting them with that agency again because sometimes that just happens in that and it takes several times before they get the help that they need. And we don't want to see them get, get referred again and have to start the process all over again. So the key project partners in this is obviously the Edmonton Police Service because police services take the majority of calls. Uh, Edmonton Fire Rescue, all the city of Edmonton basically call intake, all their peace officers, transit, 311, all those places. Canadian Mental Health because in Edmonton, they're responsible for operating 211 who dispatches our crisis diversion teams. Alberta Health Services, EMS, uh, will be a key partner in Alberta Mental Health and Addiction and that too, because a part of this, we will be integrating mental health workers, not just on the police side, but obviously in, in an integrated model where they're assisting all partners that are providing assistance and support to individuals in need or those in crisis. So a little bit real quickly is kind of how we got here, project history. So this idea was really conceptualized about two years ago 
when Chief McVeigh and Edmonton asked me to do a review basically of our police communications branch at that time. So as part of that review, we really identified the need for integration that we couldn't continue doing this as it is if we really wanted to see improved outcomes. So Chief McVee has been a very good driver behind this to you as the city of Edmonton and really moving this project forward. So as this kind of went along, it was identified as a recommendation uh, by a task force that was in, uh, formed in Edmonton back in, in 2021. It was called Edmonton Community Safety and Wellness Task Force. And in that, the recommendation was for an integrated model and how, to, how it kind of had to be a bit separated from, from the police. Uh, we don't see, you don't like kind of the term separation and diversion in off-ramping. I think sometimes they can be used too much. They can be used if it's about working in partnership together, but just diverting to other agencies without improved outcomes sometimes can be problematic. So from that then, and stuff, a business case was done by Cornerstone Planning Group out of the West Coast. And they really did a lot of great work in identifying the current state really where opportunities for improvement existed. So that kind of moved forward and the work kind of, uh, kind of progressed. And then in early uh, last year in 2022, the city manager identified the need for this integrated call evaluation and dispatch center and a community safety and well-being strategy that was developed for the city of Edmonton. So the project officially commenced in May of this year with the onboarding of a project manager. Uh, key to these things that you'll I'll touch on briefly is having the right governance committee and the steering committee that consists of everybody involved in this entire process. And as part of this too, we developed an integrated response and support continuum that you'll see here shortly that really speaks about kind of the phases that you need to go through in this approach. So real quickly, yeah. Our outcomes, what are we looking to achieve with this model is that streamlined call intake process that I've spoken about, getting this the services and support that you need at the right time. Yes, it is an integrated facility. Like I says, it's not about a facility. A facility is simply a tool really like says to deliver a new service delivery model. Improved data sharing, shared technologies and workflows are critical. That's work that's ongoing through a number of working groups that we have. So partnerships and communications, I can't stress the importance of that in communication all the time. Uh, the 24 seven partnered service delivery model, really ensuring those right resources at the initial call for service, and then ensuring that people are getting the supports ongoing that they need. Uh, integration of mental health experts into this model so that they will assist in call evaluation and coordination of those long-term supports that people will need and assisting in the development of this multi-agency data sharing and case management model, which I said is critical to this work. So at the end of this, it, like says, achieving these would really be success in this program. And this is really where we're headed, like says, in a real positive direction. So we have real strong support for this. So I just want to share with you real basically here is an integrated response and support continuum model. So where I want to start with is where I started in the beginning of my presentation is that everything starts with a call for service or contact with an individual. And this is, so these are all opportunities then where we can ensure that people are getting that support that they need. So then moving along, it moves along to your integrated call and evaluation dispatch phase. So that really then is that first phase in determining what is the best response. And that is quite often a partnered response that can be with police, with mental health, with, with social navigators, with other outreach agencies, really dependent on the situation. The response phase, this is where then truly that assessment is made then to ensure that people are getting not only the immediate support that they need, but also the follow-up supports as well too. Then you move on to that, and this is the role where we're looking for an agency like CMHA or others or other partners involved with them to really participate in that 24 to 72 hour stabilization phase. This is where the first follow up occurs with individuals, and it's the first stage or first phase in that path in a case management phase to ensuring then to get people more towards that sustainable change. And it's the case management base of this that is going to require a lot of work because that's getting people into those supports 
and what they need and part of the peer supports and the lived experience so that they can move on. I won't spend a lot of time on this one. This is just really just being mindful of time really breaks down what a case management phase really looks like when you're looking at an integrated model like this. So this is very much based on a public safety and public health perspective as to how this, this would occur moving forward. He lastly is part of an integrated concept. And just put this together to show is that within an integrated model and in a facility, this would actually exist where we have this multi-agency resource coordination hub. So these would be all the partners and stuff that would be working within a 24 model. And their role will truly be then looking at calls, all calls for service, not just police calls, crisis calls, all calls for service, all these partners working together in real time and that sharing information together and determining what is that best resource to ensure that best outcome. So it's really part of a resource coordination hub. Next steps in this project, and that is obviously like we're continuing on with a lot of the work that we're really doing, like this, and I'll take you through much of this, at least is more than happy to talk to any agency that wants a little bit more about this, where I kind of want to finish up on on this is really kind of the lessons learned. So <clears throat> this is obviously is, is quite a monumental task to take this on. And I'll be honest, there's a lot of doubters when you're talking about this type of a shared vision, but it very much has to be a shared vision that's truly supported by all the agencies. They truly have to believe in the outcomes of this is that you can truly make positive outcomes in people's lives and community safety if you have a shared vision and you're working together. So I can't emphasize so much that strong partnerships are critical in this moving this forward. There has to be a very clear understanding of your project outcomes and deliverables. So really everybody is pulling in the same direction. So I say all the time, we're better together. And that's really kind of the message we're trying to drive home. And there needs to be that dedicated commitment by all partner agencies. And so as you can imagine, there's a number of agencies that are involved in dealing with crisis or people, individuals in need. So it is about bringing them together and really getting the buy-in for that shared vision. So that's where the communication is really important. And trust me, you really need executive support and engagement through this process. We've been very fortunate places to have the strong support of Chief McBee and the city manager here at Edmonton that are very much behind this project and supporting it because it definitely does need that. Uh, and lastly, I want to talk about kind of we a lesson we learned is that we engaged probably far too many people in, in our initial steering committee that really hampered effective decision making. So what I would really encourage that I says if this is a project is to really keep that steering committee to a side that's very, very manageable so that you can have that streamlined decision making. Because with bringing this many people kind of to the party, everybody kind of has an idea of what it should look like. So as much as Lisa says you want to bring that, you have to be able to move forward things along too. So I think it's really about finding a medium between the two to be able to do that. So so that kind of concludes my presentation. Like says I look forward to hearing your feedback. I'm welcome, like says to speaking with any agencies who are thinking of going down this path because integrated kind of call evaluation centers are definitely something that more agencies are looking at. I know that many agencies have, have been contacted by many agencies throughout Canada for more information about this. So uh, I thank you for the time this afternoon to be able to present about what we're doing. And like I says, I really look forward to hearing your feedback. Right, I'll just leave, oh, I just thought you could just leave that up for a little bit just to make sure everyone got your contact I'll, information. I'll put it back up then. Yeah, perfect. Uh, that way I can just, it'll give me an excuse to to talk a little bit. Um, Dave, thank you very much for that. And I was, I was really keen on making sure that we had an executive police manager um, participating in this conversation uh, because, there we go. Yeah, I think, uh, and as you noted, you know, it's very important to have the buy-in from outside agencies and organizations, which normally with some police services, sometimes there might be a reluctance or reticence to involve themselves. And so, that's, I think, um, most of the battle, uh, just to get people on board. I had just three quick points I wanted to just spit out. Uh, I liked what you said there, uh, 
uh, getting people at the beginning when they're in need versus when they're in crisis. And uh, I actually, you know, I, I looked up again the uh, 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 Sir Robert Peel's policing principles. And of course, number one is to prevent crime and disorder, right? And the last one, number nine, is to recognize that the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder, not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with them. So just looking at the first and last of those principles, um, it I think speaks directly to that point about people who are in need versus in crisis and, and just getting trapped up in that traditional uh, police as a, as a reactionary response, as opposed to a preemptive and preventative response. So definitely something to look into. Uh, the second point here was I like how it, it seems like things are moving from or, or to um, from public safety to a multidisciplinary public health approach. Yes. And and maybe this is going to be the future of policing in the modern age, especially with with, you know, increased needs and attention to needs, whether it's mental health or other needs. Um, this is definitely something that police services need to. Uh, adapt to really quickly because the situation changes so quickly. And lastly, uh, uh, you know, I, I wrote here and you kind of mentioned at the end there about steering committees and not having, you know, too many people, um, too many hands in the pie, so to speak. And and my question, I'm just going to put the question out there and really this might fall to Bree or Rick, uh, how processes can jam up a solution pathway? And that's so I just wanted to throw that off uh, to our subsequent speaker. So Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, really appreciate that. Appreciate that. Hope you guys got his contact for information. Um, and for our lottery, Bree helped. <laughs> Professor, over to you. All right. Let me go ahead and share. And then since I will not be able to see you, can someone tell me if you see the slides? Yes, we do. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Um, thank you, everyone. I'm truly honored that I was asked to speak today, um, especially for this uh, forum. And we're seeing a lot of dialogue, especially within the U.S., because um, I'm not from Canada. Um, and I also don't know what a Tim Hortons or Norton's is. I'm assuming it's a fast food service. So you guys can make fun of me for that. Um, but we've had a lot of dialogue about police community relations and communication, especially since the COVID-19 pandemic and the social justice movements that happened, um, the death of black and brown people within the United States, um, as well as the relationship between uh, police departments and educational institutions um, in terms of mass shooting events. Um, we actually just had another mass shooting at Michigan State um, and my heart is breaking because of that. But um, hopefully what I will discuss with you all is just some of the things that I've carried with me and how I view communication as being key um, to effective response and recovery um, and some strategies that I see used and strategies that I wish were implemented a bit more with our first responder agencies. I do also um, uh, love the importance of the land acknowledgement. So I'm going to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm on today, which is the Powhatan Confederacy and pay respect to their elders past and present. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I am an assistant professor at Virginia Commonwealth University in the Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. I've worked with public and private sectors, also nonprofits, and a variety of educational institutions from predom predominantly white to minority serving to historically black colleges. Um, and I'm usually the first white female hired in some of those uh, minority serving institutions. So. Um, that says something about the ability to communicate interculturally um, and with different people um, who have different needs. Um, at these institutions, I maintain close relationships with campus police departments, um, especially if I was working with a student in crisis, whether it's suicide ideation, sexual assault, um, drugs, domestic violence disputes. Um, there's been a variety of things I've had to respond to and uh, the communication with campus police especially um, was essential um, and there have been some negative uh, issues and then there's been some positive um, but it really does go back on to what has been reiterated about building trust with your community um, and getting to know them and 
having them see where you're coming from and also understanding where they're coming from, creating a common foundation, being able to communicate that um, uh, effectively. I've also done response, uh, disaster response and recovery work in uh, Puerto Rico um, after Hurricane Maria. Um, and so communication was key there as I worked with the local churches. Um, that's where the community went for assistance. They did not trust government officials or first responder agencies. Um, so if they wanted help, they were gonna go to their pastors and um, that's where we dug in. Um, I also have a couple books out. Um, one is an award-winning book on cultural competence for emergency and crisis management, talking about theories, concepts, and case studies. Um, this book has actually been utilized by the United States Federal Emergency Management Agency, um, fire service, police service, um, and then educational institutions as ways to talk about different cultures and response and recovery situations and how to communicate and what needs to occur. And then my newest book coming out is about uh, crisis communication planning and strategies for nonprofit leaders. This came after uh, COVID-19 and we were reached out to by uh, several nonprofits who had never had to create a crisis communication plan and didn't really know what to do. So we decided to um, put it in a book and hopefully help some people out. Um, so as you'll see, the majority of my work focuses on crisis communication, cultural competence, community resilience, and um, educational or training competencies. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So when I talk about crisis communication, I'm looking at these um, crises, which are just perceptions of an unpredictable event that threatens stakeholder expectations. It can impact performance. Um, and it usually leads to negative outcomes, but there's always a potential alerting opportunity within that to create positive growth. Um, we've seen from recent incidents in the US with the mass shooting events, with Uvalde, um, how even though things have failed, and I'll use the term failed, and I mean failed, um, there are ways to mitigate that from ever happening again um, and to assess and evaluate what was done, what was not done, and how we can move forward uh, with that. Crisis communication itself is an ongoing process of generating shared meaning among stakeholders um, concerning the actual environment of this crisis that is happening to uh, prepare, reduce, limit, and respond to the threats that occur. Um, some of the key things is about the fact that communication is an ongoing process. It's very intentional. And when you're talking about shared meaning, that hinges on you being able to effectively communicate with the individuals of your community, along with your other first responder agencies, um, so that everyone feels like they are being heard and validated, that there's trust being built. Um, and then especially for community members lately, that they feel safe that they know that their law enforcement agencies are going to, to show up when they need to um, and not in a negative context. And so in terms of managing some of these crises, um, some areas that are uh, necessary for success is cognition, communication, coordination, and control. Cognition and communication are really the key here. It's about the individuals being able to understand the messages you are sending out, even if it's via, uh, via social media. Um, so Randy's TikTok, <laughs> um, being able to make sure that individuals who maybe are not English speakers can understand the messages, um, those who are deaf, hard of hearing, uh, visually impaired, there's a ton of access issues when it comes to communication and most agencies tend to just push information out. It's usually limited or it diverts to another web page or website for more information versus just providing some of that real time um, info that Randy was even alluding to with the, with the search for that child. Um, those are actually great things, great things to do. One of the best things that I like within my field is this theory. It's called situational crisis communication theory. And the thing is with this theory is that it looks at the reputation of an agency along with how they will respond to a crisis and how they will adapt their response based on the crisis itself. Um, there's a number of crises that we face from natural hazards to technological issues. You have your civil conflict issues, riots, um, all of these types of things. And you shouldn't be communicating the same for every single crisis. Each crisis has unique needs and your community will have unique needs based off of those crises as well. Another thing about this uh, theory is um, with that reputation piece. It's all about focusing on building positive reputations between the agency and the stakeholder. So it's how someone, the community member like myself, will assign blame 
or glory to the agency that responds, to the organization that responds. Um, some of these strategies that they talk about in the beginning um, concerns denial, diminishing, rebuilding, and bolstering. In my experience, I've seen a lot of denial strategies, um, which is where the organization will just try to pass off the event and the blame to someone else. They will um, find someone to be their, their scapegoat um, and they will attack those individuals to try and take attention off of them and what they may have not done well within that incident. Um, diminished strategies I see a lot as well where they try to reduce their perceived responsibilities. Um, so they justify an excuse of like, oh, well, we weren't supposed to be here at this time. This was actually this agency's role. Um, and so not technically saying you should blame this other agency, but it's a, well, I'm going to put this little seed of doubt in you and maybe I'll divert your attention from myself. Rebuild strategies are attempting to improve the reputation and can include compensation and apologies. This is one that I am seeing some organizations starting to utilize, but very rarely. This is that idea of I'm going to take um, responsibility for what we did not do well, and I'm going to showcase how we're going to do better. Um, something that continues to, to be a, um, a goal is that the people of the first responders in the community, that they are able to have a relationship that is built on trust and empathy. It's very authentic. Um, it's knowledgeable and credible that people will actually listen to the agency um, versus saying, oh, they don't know what they're talking about, or they obviously are not the ones that I want coming to my house to respond to this crisis, so I'm not even going to talk to them. Um, and then the last one is one that you can use with any strategy, but it's a bolstering strategy. So you try and draw on any goodwill that you have um, in support of others. So that's that idea of, we know we did wrong. We need your help to help us be better um, and having that communication. I find that that's very difficult for some of our law enforcement agencies in the United States. I won't throw that to Canada because I'm not exactly sure, um, but it's this idea of, asking the public for help sometimes or asking for their feedback on what could be done better is opening up a dialogue that some are not comfortable with having um they in in the u.s a lot of our law enforcement agencies are very hierarchical um they have a lot of administrative red tape they have been trained to respond in a specific way so if they do not have this hierarchy in place or communication hierarchy in place during an incident like Uvalde, then it kind of freezes everybody um the younger police officers don't want to engage because they are possibly going to be reprimanded by their um, older um, police officers and sometimes you can't push a suggestion forward for fear of backlash um, so it becomes one of those this is how it's always done and this is how it's always going to be done and we're finding out now that we can't afford to do that anymore um, we just can't afford to do that some of the crisis response strategies as well um, that I've seen are some of the attack on the accuser. So if the public blames the agency, the agency blames the public. Well, they get in our way. Um, whenever we're in a response, they, they want to engage with us right then and we need to be on mission. Totally understandable. But also that community is suffering the crisis just like they are and they need someone to validate that experience um, for them. Um, so when Dave was talking about this integrated model, I was just like, yes, because um, you can have mental health workers or counselors be like, have that person, the communication officer to say, you know, we have people coming, if you could just bear with us for a little bit. Um, and then that way, the uh, first responders can do their job um, and, and get done what that needs to be done. Um, then you have the denial, like there's no crisis at all. We're fine. Um, I'm seeing this a lot. Um, of the, our communication efforts are fine. We have our social media liaison, they're sending out information. We talk with the media, they're sending out information. But that's very limiting because you're expecting that the audience that you're trying to reach is going to receive that message, that they're going to comprehend the message and that they will act on the message. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, a lot of agencies like to push information out but they don't pull people back in. They don't ask questions or engage them in other ways to make those communications more effective. And there's a few more on the list that I won't go um, through completely, um, but I do see that the response strategies that tend to be more on the negative side in terms of the impact to the organization are being used more frequently. 
than those that say, this is how um, we did it. We apologize. This is what we're going to move forward. Or we appreciate your feedback. This is the new program that we're going to try and implement and see how it works. Um, this is the corrective action we're taking, and this is our full apology. Um, some agency best practices that I promote um, is that you need to have effective communication processes and policy development. This is really internal within the agency itself um, because I do find that those officers who do talk to me off the record will say that they can't say anything, they'll be reprimanded. And like, they won't, it won't help them. They won't get that promotion they're looking for. They won't be able to move up. Um, and that's unfair. And again, this is US based. Um, the ones that I've talked to are more based in my state of Virginia, also Florida that I worked a lot with um, when I was there. And so it's this idea that there's not even a policy in place to help them feel safe to bring these suggestions up. They have the, you know, the whistleblower policies and so forth, but that doesn't do much when it comes down to, they will be discovered if they make a comment and then they, it will come against them in a negative way. Um, we need to change that culture. We need to change that, <clears throat> that dialogue that's going on there. Also partnerships with the public. We need to engage them and see what did we not do well? Who did we not reach in our communication strategies? Who didn't know what was going on and felt unsafe in that situation? With the mass shootings that have happened, we just also had one at a mall in, I think, Texas was the most recent. And it's just this idea of people don't feel safe leaving their homes anymore. Um, and a lot of that too is this with COVID, it took away some people's like belief of their rights, you know, being in lockdown and um, having to wear masks and doing all these things. And then we have all of a sudden all these mass shootings that are happening from mental health issues and and all this and and nobody knows really what to do. Well, we need to start figuring that out. Um, also pre-event planning. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. We tend to be very reactive in emergency management, and I find that first responders tend to be very reactive. We're trained that way. And I say the U.S. again, we'll contextualize. Um, we tend to be very reactive, and it's a, oh, this is happening, now we go. Instead of saying, hey, let's do another tabletop, let's do a simulation, let's try and figure out and bring all of our partners on board and play this scenario out to see what challenges and barriers can we already acknowledge and try to mitigate before the event actually happens. Um, short story, I know I'm trying to be cognizant of time as well. Um, when I was at one university, it was a landlocked university and they had a campus police department and I helped with planning and implementing the active shooter simulation. It was the first one. Um, so we had our campus police, we had our campus administrators, we had counseling, we had um, our emergency medical services, fire, police, tactical, everybody was on campus to play this out. And the communication aspect was funny to me. So they decided that they were going to tell everyone that this was happening by sending out an email and putting it on the, um, uh, the university's main webpage. I told them, that is not gonna work. <laughs> Students don't check their emails. Um, and even some faculty and staff don't check them. I'm not going to throw people under the bus, but emails don't always get checked in a timely manner. And then you have it on a website that most people don't check if they're already at the university. They've already been accepted. They're already working there. They're not looking at those. And so it's like, we need to do more. And so it's like, you need to send out text messaging systems, put it on our social media accounts. That's where students are are looking and so that's where they're most likely going to get information make sure there's a media post about it um and that there's stories going out in multiple languages um and really try and branch this out so that everyone knows it's a simulation especially at a landlocked university we have neighboring communities people living right across the street from the university we didn't need to cause any stress um and no matter what i said um those suggestions were unheeded um, and it came down to, in the simulation, one, a uh, few students were on campus, of course, and all of a sudden the shots ring out and they go um, in different directions. So we are chasing down these students to try and help them. One specifically was a veteran with post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, and had, we ended up having to um, tranquilize him pretty much and subdue him because he was triggered. And so that was a whole event that had to unpack that we could have avoided. Um, by simply just having a different communication strategy. 
Um, listening to the concerns and understanding audience needs. Everybody has different needs. Um, something in emergency management I find is that we try to treat everyone the same, but they're not the same. We need to acknowledge the differences that lie within specific communities and make response and communication efforts that align with what they will need at the time of a crisis and specifically the different type of crisis that that community will come into contact with. Um, meeting the needs of the media, remaining accessible is always good, collaborating, coordinating with credible sources. So people, um, spokespeople for the community, um, if there, it's a, a religious community, the churches, the mosques, um, the, the temples, all of that. Um, a big part is communicating with empathy and concern. Um, we as community members, we want to see that this also affects you. Um, there is this belief also by community members that first responders are not at all affected by the crises that they have to respond to. And we know that that's not true. We've seen the decline in mental health in our first responders um, because of that assumption that I need to be 100% all the time. And if not, I'm vulnerable or um, I'm not gonna be able to keep this job and so forth. And we need to acknowledge the mental health impact of these events on our first responders and communicate that with the community as well. Um, accepting uncertainty and ambiguity. Everyone doesn't always like to know that there's unknowns. Um, we like to create structure from chaos, but sometimes maybe just realize we have to be a little bit flexible. This is our plan, but with every new information that comes in, the plan will alter and change. If we don't have a plan for this specific incident, we'll put it um, on for a discussion later as we assess and evaluate what's going on and we will uh, redo our plans and update them. And then promoting self-efficacy. So being able to encourage individuals to actually do this uh, themselves and being able to have the skills uh, to do so. And now I'm running out of time here, so I'm gonna try and be very quick, <laughs> I'm so sorry. So for planning for communication, very generally, you wanna identify the crisis, establish appropriate response strategies, implement, and the biggest one that I find most people do not do is assess and evaluate you need to look back and see specifically what went wrong, what can we do to, to avoid it in the future. I have this uh, framework that I created utilizing the situational crisis communication theory um, and emergency management planning in terms of crisis communication. Um, if anyone's interested, my uh, email is going to be coming up soon. Feel free to reach out to me and I'll send you the article um, that it was uh, published in. Um, again, this was created to help individuals who didn't really know where to get started with um, creating uh, crisis communication plans or even being able to update and assess and evaluate in a different way. And in terms of implementing these strategies, you need to implement them. You can't just create them, put them in a binder on a desk that no one's going to read about. Um, dedicate time to do this. Um, adapt for specific crises identify those communication challenges and barriers, these are things I've all said, um, staged or direct implementation. So either roll out communication policies slowly and see how they work or just go full force into it. I always say staged. It's better to see kind of how things are happening and to kind of like test it a little bit because you may have to alter it. Um, anticipate pushback, um, invest in capacity building and then practice, practice, practice. Um, we all could use some practice. And here we are, I'm done. I only went over by like a minute 20. Very excited about that. I talk a lot. <laughs> That's fine, Brie. Just leave your, just leave that up for a little bit. I'm holding uh, By the way, Tim Hortons is a religious establishment here oh, in Canada. So not that so, good at all. Yeah, Wonderful. no, no, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, fantastic presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm sure and I hope um, some of the participants will reach out to you uh, to see some of those slides. I was. Definitely keen to see how um, how you arrange that. Just very quick points from me before I pass it over to our friend Rick. Um, I really like the crisis response strategy section. Um, really, the point about it's a unique situation every time, mm -hmm. and um, you know to be adaptable at that level does really require a level of planning and uh, implementation, and that I think feeds into your practice, practice, practice. Uh, the more you do these sorts of things, the the easier you'll kind of um, get at it um and you know you'll be able to actually deal with it uh, with a little less anxiety and panic at that moment yeah. mm -hmm. um i wanted to just uh actually you mentioned some things and i won't take too much time here uh you mentioned uvaldi for example which mm -hmm. uh, was a very bad failure for sure uh, not just the event itself but even afterwards we weren't mm -hmm. getting a lot of information and there was a lot of 
in Canada, of course, we've had some issues. There was a pretty major event that happened in Nova Scotia. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still kind of fresh in everyone's mind. I'm not going to really spend too much time on that, uh, but just want to put it in people's minds that there has been a discussion on what kind of social media strategies or just crisis communication strategies could have been uh, brought to bear on that. But right. what I want to do actually is uh, if I can just steal a minute, uh, just a minute, I want to... Um, so I think you can, can you bring down your presentation now? Yeah. Uh, make sure you you reach out to Brie. I really liked that. Um, but what I wanted to do here is, uh, I think it's a tab, I think it's a window. Um, this right here. Um, very recently, for those of you who were following, um, a London Met police officer was convicted for being a serial rapist. Um, and just looking at some of the things you put at the end there, um, at the end there in terms of the uh, agency best practices, look at how the Met Commissioner responds to this, to this event. This man abused women in the most disgusting manner. It is sickening. We have let women and girls down, and indeed we've let Londoners down. The women who suffered and survived this violence have been unimaginably brave and courageous in coming forward. And I do understand also that this will lead to some women across London questioning whether they can trust the Met to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. We have failed and I'm sorry. He should not have been a police officer. We haven't applied the same sense of ruthlessness to guarding our own integrity that we routinely apply to confronting criminals. We failed in two respects. We failed as investigators where we should have been more intrusive and join the dots on his repeated misogyny over a couple of decades. And as leaders, our mindset should have been more determined to root out such a misogynist. These failures are horrific examples of the systemic failures that concern me and were highlighted by Baroness Casey in her recent review. Yeah, just wanted to, but just give you an example of uh, how I think, I mean, you did a really good job given, you know, the situation that they faced. Rick, my friend, it's it is over time. to you. It is time. I'm, uh, I'm humbled to come after the circulars earlier, uh, Officer Arsenal. I will look for your TikTok and my TikTok fix that I get regularly. Nice. Uh, and Bria, I really appreciated your presentation, and I'm going to hopefully build on it a little bit. Uh, I think, John, you've got my presentation coming up. Thanks for the reminder, Rick. Stand by one. It'll take a moment. My apologies. No worries. I'm, I'm going to just hijack this for a second. Randy, I think your video was not at all ridiculous. I was it was great and I've seen a lot of your stuff so I'm kind of biased in that sense. Uh you've really done a really good I mean really well job really well done job on I think you understand the mindset right of young people and I think I mean you're you're 48 so you're one of the younger officers now I guess. Um <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, know, yeah. you know it's it's really important to understand like how how do you like what how do you do that? Like how do you train somebody to do that? You know what I've also I've always kind of just been an earlier adopter of things. And, uh, you know, through, tr through trial and error, uh, of course, through trial and error, uh, but just by being an early adopter and listening to youth, I mean, one of the, one of the worst things we can do, and I learned this from my, my father, actually, from when he, uh, you know, changed positions into the Aboriginal peacekeeping unit, um, just his ability to really listen to the youth, because if you want to know what's going on, if you want to know what's going to be popular in the in, in next six months, whether, doesn't matter, styles, it could be a new app that's coming up. Just pay attention to use. Don't push them off. Listen to what they're saying. That's a good question. But I mean, this, uh, certainly my my position as a school resource officer, uh, I really, uh, I, I did learn from youth. It was a two-way street. Thanks for yeah, asking that. I, I got a bunch at home here and uh, they think they know everything. So I, I don't ask these youth. You'll probably, <laughs> get, a, you'll probably get a better, uh, better response from them. Mm -hmm. Rick, my friend. Let's do this. Perfect. Uh, feel free to go to the next page. I'm going to talk a little bit about culture and communication within policing. I'll, I'll share a brief introduction. I'll get into what I believe is the current state of culture and communication in policing. What's the impact of poor culture? 
and some strategies and tips to improve culture and then give an opportunity at the end for Q&A. So if you don't mind going to the next slide, I'll kind of do that introduction. Um, Peace, that's the company we started. Uh, I, I jokingly say I have seven kids in four different companies, so the ADHD is strong in me. And uh, one of those companies we have focuses on uh, law enforcement and military organizations. We have clients like the FBI, the uh, State De Bureau of Investigations, uh, the United States Marines, Canadian Department of Defense, and others. And, and we're really, our expertise is, is bringing data to the surface around human analytics. Uh, you know, and I, and I kind of share that because I, I think that data, uh, capturing that data from people is important, and it actually really helps create what we really strongly focus on, which is organizational health. I, I need to know where I'm at in order to know where to go on that journey. Um, we utilize the latest technology and as well as research on, on psychology, and, and my slant is on industrial psychology, and that's, that's what I did my degree on, along with uh, an MBA. On the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities that we've seen and, and that we you know, are mostly aware of. First challenge really is that miscommunication and misunderstanding between police and communities. Um, the video that you just played moving was a great example of good, clear, concise communication. You know, it, it, it stood well on saying, here's what the issue is. We take responsibility. Here's what we wish we would have done in hindsight, and here's what we're going to do better going forward. And it was very brief, and, and it actually was a good example of where the community would see that and not be able to respond to much miscommunication. When we see other things, like we were joking earlier about uh, all the UFOs getting shot down. You know, to me, that's a great example of miscommunication and how it fosters all kinds of theories and speculations and things like that where we could have been clear and concise of what it is while still sharing appropriately what we know today. The other challenge is that low level of trust and confidence in policing among some communities. You guys feel it and face it all the time. You know, that, that low level of trust gets in the way of lots that you're trying to do and lots of good work that we're trying to be about. And the third one I'm just gonna highlight, although there's others there, is there is a bit of a resistance and reluctance to embracing new ideas and new possibilities we've got to overcome that hurdle within policing in order to be able to move forward it's it's you know being responsive to change and new ideas out there now that does create the opportunities though that we see law enforcement starting to act on and one of those is a growing recognition of the importance of culture and communication and policing that that communication and culture piece is so critical to kind of going back to you know, we talked about Peel's vision for policing. Let's go back to that vision. And communication and culture is going to be so paramount to doing that. The other side that we see as positive opportunity is that increased public demand for accountability and transparency. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of transparency. I think if done well, actually breeds better culture and it breeds better opportunities to feel more positive about the work that you're about. And the third thing I just want to highlight amongst all those other things on there is there's, there's a strong willingness of some police organizations to embrace change and innovation. It, you know, innovation can be hard when you're constrained by budget, you're constrained by community demands and things like that. But there is a vast untapped knowledge well of what can we do different within policing if we can just figure out how to access that. So we see that policing is responding to that opportunity of innovation and change. Just next slide, please. I want to share in the next slide, um, you know, we, we've assessed a number of organizations. We, we, we go in, I, I'm less concerned about engagement as I am, as I said, about the organizational health. And, and part of organizational health is looking across the work environment in the context of policies and procedures, communication, um, what's, what's performance standards, how do people live vision and values and things like that. And so one of the stats that, that I pulled up here and you can see the blue, red, yellow markers. And that blue marker would be, and this is all within uh, police organizations, that blue marker would be an individual contributor. The red markers would be their managers and the yellow marker would be the executives. So think of that difference there. I wanna talk about 
some of those questions. And so specifically, if you look on the right side, question 94, the question is the organization has shared decision making. And what's interesting when you look at that, that question 94, you can see that the executives highly respond that they believe their shared decision making. And yet a manager and individual officer would say that's actually not true. In fact, I think the number is about less than 50% felt that that was true. Now, that, that perception opens up interesting conversations about what are policies around communication? What are practices we have around communication? And, and how much communication is one direction down versus two-way communication up and down throughout the ranks? Some of the impacts that you guys would feel around poor culture and communication within policing are strained relationships between police and communities. We talked about that. That, that miscommunication, misunderstanding leads to tension and conflicts. I said one of our clients is, is a State Department of the Bureau of Investigation, and we would have heard recently about the Memphis Task Force, uh, Scorpion, and how that young man died at the hands of five of those officers. That, that led to tensions and had a potential to conflict those tensions. And we've seen before in the past some of those things, not only down south, but even within Canada, those tensions lead to conflicts. And it leads to low levels of trust. And, and then that trust leads to re resistance and reluctance to engage. The other aspect we talked about is reduced effectiveness of policing. Poor culture can hinder the ability of officers just to do their jobs effectively. And, and that's going to be extremely frustrating when you're trying to do the right things in the right manner. And because of that culture, it's, it's inhibited that. It can also lead to missed opportunities for collaboration and cooperation within the community. I, I saw, Bree, in your presentation, you talked about that collaboration, and so also did Dave, that collaboration with other agencies, right? Just going back to some of those stats again, if I look at question 89, which is the lowest ranked one, employee engagement is participative versus being acted on. And kind of a general sentiment within policing is there's lots of room to improve how participative we, we do things. The other question of interest is I feel trusting that my department encourages my involvement and merits my commitment. So we talk about innovation and that, that's a very specific question we ask occasionally. And you see that disconnect between, again, executive seal, they are participative, but Two thirds of your staff are saying not really, or, or, or sorry, one third is saying not really. And so these disconnects that we're able to measure in terms of health within police force allow us to go in and review together policies and procedures, review practices to say, if we could move these metrics up, what would be the impact within culture and communication of policing? Just a couple of points on accountability and transparency. A lack of open and honest communication reduces transparency. It, it just flat out every time. When there's low accountability, transparency always drops with that and it er erodes public trust. The missed opportunity for positive change, poor culture can prevent organizations from embracing new ideas and approaches. And whether it's a, it's a public organization or a private organization, that also is always true. And the other point on missed opportunities, it can hinder the development of inclusiveness and diverse policing practices. You know, we work lots with uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. And some of those things we see really flush out there in terms of opportunity for a positive change. Now, in the next slide, you'll see we play lots into engagement. And we've heard this talked about before, but the root of that, I want you to just imagine it like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That first base need is the need for safety, that, that psychological safety within an organization. Can I speak up without fear of retribution? Can I, can I share information without fear that it's gonna cost me in some way or another, right? And when we address those safety needs, we can move up to that need of sense of belonging or connectiveness. And above that sense of belonging and connectiveness, am I contributing to the organization in meaningful ways? Am I, able to see my impact into the community. And then above that, am I learning and growing and developing as, as an individual within the organization? And, and we spend a lot of time measuring across that spectrum where people are at. And that allows interventions. Think of all the people interventions that happen within police organizations. 
when we can measure where the concentration of populations at, our interventions are more specific and more meaningful. And we can measure the impact of those interventions as well. Just to share, uh, continue on, I want to talk about some strategies now, now that we've talked about some of the impact. On the next slide, you'll see some of those strategies, and again, all related to some of our data that we've collected. Building culture of trust and transparency. We talk lots about that, that trust and transparency. And I'll just share a couple of practices that, that we know help. Uh, when we're able to encourage open and honest communication through regular feedback and suggestion opportunities, trust and transparency goes up. There are good mechanisms to sharing that and, and you know, We'd, we'd love to share that another time. The other thing we'd say to build culture of trust and transparency is to foster transparency through regular reporting and evaluations. Um, I, I think that reporting mechanism and those evaluation mechanisms, especially at that mid-manager level, really helps organizations foster culture of trust and transparency. The stat that I highlighted here, you can again see that disconnect between what executives believe and notice that managers are even lower than individual contributors, that communication with management is typically two-way. And so if I have that much gap between how executives feel and managers feel about two-way communication, that's a sentiment that I'm not getting communicated to or I'm getting communicated to in silos, right? And, and that, that leads to that, again, lack of trust and transparency. We wanna encourage open and honest communication. We provide ongoing training. We do lots of training around effective communication skills. And we do lots of training around fostering a, a, a culture that recognizes and values diversity and thought of opinion. And I'll tell you, in my experience, again, private or public, that's probably one of the toughest sells is that there's huge value in diversity of thought and opinion. Uh, the other area that we suggest is investing in training and professional development. Uh, again, whether it's private or public, when funds are scarce, training is often the first thing that gets dropped. And yet it's the thing that often makes the biggest difference in creating a good culture in organizations. Uh, fourth thing is fostering a culture of inclusiveness and diversity. And I've, I've talked about this a little bit. I'll just share a couple of quick practices. Uh, provide ongoing training on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I often joke about uh, Starbucks as an example. You might remember they all they shut down all of their stores for half a day and they all went through diversity equity inclusion training and Howard Schultz came out to the press and said we've done it we've checked the box on training yet training is an event doesn't change behavior right it's, it's about constantly reinforcing all, over time what that new value and new behavior is that actually makes it stick and the other thing i'd say is encouraging officers to seek out opportunities for cross-cultural exchange and collaboration is, is a, a highly proven best practice around that. Next slide, please, John. Now, I'm going to share a couple of stats here. I won't show them all, but I did make those slides available to you. I want to point out question uh, 35, and that's on the, the top, the second from the left. And the question is, when I should be involved in a departmental decision, I actually am usually involved in the process. And notice again that disconnect. So a lot of officers are saying, I think this impacts me and it impacts my role and it impacts the expertise that I bring to that decision or process, yet I'm not involved as I feel I should be. The other one is the one on the far right, question 102, leadership tends to share information. And again, it's an interesting disconnect on executives that feel they do share information and yet managers and, and frontline officers are saying not as much as you might think you do. And, and often what we see is it's a function of operating within silos or being worried about what information should I share that's right in the right frequency in the right format. So they tend to favor sharing less than trying to figure out what is that right formula. Now on the bottom, just two I wanna point out. Uh, the first one's question 56 and that's second from the left. Communications good across departments and functions. So again, going back to often within the organizations we work with, they feel they communicate well, but what what when they actually see the data, it's communicated in silos and almost 
just not enough information and not clear enough. And so people are ended up wondering what the communication was intended to be or the reliance on the rumor mill to kind of get around and share what, what should be shared. And the other one I want to share is on the far right 71, specifically on the downward flow of information in the organization is open and as transparent as it could be. It's good to notice these disconnects. It's good to notice to say, you know, a lot of executives feel they're doing the right things and they're trying to, but there is a miss between what the intention is and the execution as it gets down to that front line and to the manager level. Uh, just the next slide, please. Now, again, sharing some more strategies just on improving culture. Um, recognition is a huge need. In fact, we say recognition and, and validation, that's like receiving emotional oxygen. And regardless of the industry, regardless of the type or demographic, but still true within policing, the need for recognition remains high. And so you can see questions like 34, again, the second from the left, the organization provides me with many informal rewards for performance, whether it's praise or memos or other non-financial incentives, it's lacking. And, and that recognition goes a long way to improving culture. And the other one, again, on the far right is the organization provides high recognition. It's just actually calling out good behaviors and good practices in a way that is transparent across uh, all that work within that division or unit. And, and kind of all, whether you're executive or manager or an individual officer, all recognize that there's growth and opportunity to improve that area. And so, you know, highly focus on kind of those, those deep systemic things that get in the way of, of the good work that you're doing around culture and communication. You know, we just wanted to share some of those practices. The other interesting one, again, is, is that feedback is largely positive. I, I, I do find that there's often a focus on what's negative or going wrong. And yet there's just as much opportunity to learn and share and collaborate around what's going right. And yet there's just not many opportunities that organizations focus on sharing what is going right within the organization. Just that last slide, um, want to share some examples. Um, I think whenever you're focusing on changing a culture and improving communication within that culture, you need a process. You need something defined. You cannot rely on just a concentrated effort of hope and will. Uh, so you need a process. Here's ours. Feel free to, to have a look and share it and, and model it uh, or ask any questions that you like around that. Um, so that was kind of it. I wanted to share some data, some thoughts, but open up for any questions and answers that we can uh, have out there. Right on. Thanks, Rick. I was wondering if there was a contact uh, email or something. Did I miss that or is it on the, is it on a slide? Nope. Uh, okay. <laughs> so that was a miss on our end, so I'll make it simple and I'll send it to the team, but it's as simple as rick at ricktimlick.com. I'm going to put this in the chat here. Rick at ricktimlick.com. That look right? You betcha. Right on. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. I know we're almost at the end and we will, uh, I'm not going to talk much, I promise. Uh, we will go to q a but i just wanted to, to mention just some quick notes that i took here i kind of put it as institutional uh breaking that mindset and being nimble especially in a paramilitary hierarchical organization very difficult um you know there's a lot of culture that comes with that that has to kind of be um, broken a little bit um so you know not easy to do i mean changing learned behavior is very difficult and take some time immediately i even thought especially because this is on crisis communications and just the way that things get perceived even when you think about naming a unit like the scorpion unit sounds really cool i'm totally into that sort of stuff uh, but i wonder if uh, if anyone's looked at how that's perceived in the public space um you know yeah. it might be seen as too maybe too much um and and i think this falls into that general um uh disappointment that the public has with with those th those sorts of things the second point i came up with is generational 
and pardon me the way that I verbalized it here on my piece of paper, but I said, how many police managers come from the ice age before the internet? Um, you know, it requires an updated generational outlook. And I think this is uh, a lot of this comes. My, my other point was historical. What we think we know based on the way it has always been done. Um, and we kind of get stuck into that, uh, into that. We're just accustomed to it. That's just the way it is. And especially for, and I think there is a point on generational status, uh, just the way that things were done, uh, you know, not even too long ago, I'm going to say 20 years ago, it's not even, it's still within my uh, age cycle. But if you just think about people who have been in, uh, you know, police officers who have been there for 30 years, 35 years, like you can imagine the way things were done. 30 years ago and how um how how rapidly and vastly things have changed seemingly almost overnight um you know at the end of the day the last point i wanted to make you were saying about um you know investing in professional development and that sort of you know uh finding the right kind of training um i i have to use the quote by um Achillochus, the seventh uh, century bce poet and mercenary uh, we don't rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And yeah. so uh, totally, I'm a big believer in making sure that that training level has to be as high as possible um, because when, when push comes to shove, that's what your officer is going to end up doing. I'm done talking. I promise. I want to throw two points to what you said. Yeah, yeah, Rick, uh, go for the, it. The, the first point, just on, you know, that paramilitary you know, we, we often used to hear, and especially the United States Army was good at this, is that command and control was kind of the model, right? And, and they themselves have started to shift to communicate and influence as the new governing model. And that governing model is actually, you know, demonstrating that there's far more effectiveness to that. And, 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 so, and the second thought I want to share is just on that scorpion. You know, words, words have meaning and words carry energy. And, and we've seen that, especially when you have a task force with a name like Scorpion, which, you know, can sound cool, but there is energy that follows that. And that energy, you know, followed through with what we saw as some of those results. And, and not to diminish the good work that they have done, but, but we have to be mindful that words have energy and meaning to it. Absolutely. Great point. Uh, were there any questions, John, Dave, that you wanted to... There was one question. I know uh, Professor uh, Haupt, Bree, uh, Bree, also known as Professor Haupt, uh, you answered on uh, Blue Lives Matter and uh, or the Thin Blue Line. Sorry, not Blue Lives Matter. The Thin Blue Line and how uh, it was suddenly depicted as a racist symbol. I can only imagine the disappointment and, uh, you know, upset of police officers seeing that, that it's not racist. But what what? what fell apart there on the communication side well i was in the response i was saying about how there's so much that was happening at that point in time is very volatile climate and so i think individuals were just associating any symbol with racism at that time um and so it's one of those things of to mitigate that there's times when you have to respond right then and there's times when you just have to kind of let things kind of go for a minute until you have the ability and the capacity to respond in more positive manners um and to be able to speak with the public and have even facilitators and counselors there to help with the emotional um turmoil that is going on not only for our first responders but also for the community themselves um sometimes the best person to help with the dialogue is an outsider um being able to see that and actually pinpoint where the fears and the insecurities are coming from um i also a lot of communities have had historically bad relationships with police officers so of course they grabbed onto that symbol um as being equated to racism and they just kind of ran with it and so it was at that time i don't think there was much that could have been done but once emotions were a little lower then that's when you start rebuilding it and you associate that symbol with all the positive things that law enforcement is doing. You associate it with their programs or outreach campaigns, um, uh, relationships with children, uh, relationships with other agencies, the time that they actually do effectively respond to a crisis. Because uh, we're very quick to point out when we suck at it, <laughs> but we're not always quick to point out when we're doing well. Um, and so providing that into the narrative to counteract that negative piece as well. 
Randall, go for it. You know, I take a perspective up here from Canada because we never had the protests that you did in the States and we never had a lot of the, a lot of the problems and the issues uh, that officers were facing. And some, uh, rightfully so, some of the protests were, were out of anger and some of them, I, I was completely sympathetic with, with the protests. But we also can't uh, lose sight of the fact that the, the thin blue line flag, the symbol, which I've proudly worn on my uniform, uh, also uh, did show up in protests as a symbol of hate, whether it was by maybe some angry police officers or the community who may thought have thought that they were doing good, but uh, showing up and really causing trouble. And when you're happy, when you have that flagpole and you're there and you're ready to fight it, uh, uh, well, I, I mean, the narrative was lost. We lost the narrative, but it was hard to pick up at that point. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there. Thanks for that insight from, from Canada. This is a Canadian perspective here. Any burning questions uh, that were submitted, Dave and John? Well, um, just from my perspective, there are there are a number there, and I'm wondering uh, if there's not a way to somebody could copy and highlight them, uh, and we can you know, maybe farm them to individual uh, the individual speakers so that some of the participants can get a response. Because I think there were some good questions. There was also very positive comments uh, uh, to all of the presentations. I, I leave that open, uh, Mubin, if you want to pull one or two out. Uh, well, you I, I mean, I, I you know, uh, any chance I can get to uh, question, interrogate police officers, I'll take it. Uh, <laughs> but there's, there's there's only two of them here. So, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Elanik, no, I, I wanted to just uh, pick your brain a little bit because you're coming from that um, uh, executive perspective. And I want you to, I'm just, I, I wanted to know, like, how do you, how does an executive manager, police manager, uh, kind of take all these competing interests and needs and prioritize them? Like, how how do you how do how does that occur in a policing organization? I mean, that's a very good question. And though if it says I'm an executive director with Edmonton Police Service, in terms of this project, I very much approached it as that it's not that this is a partnership project. That this is not being led by a police service because that was very important, obviously, in gaining the trust, which is very important of other organizations, because too often, too many things are being viewed as police-led, and this is not a project, this, this is a community-led initiative. So I think it would have been, been very, very difficult if it was a police-led initiative to really to get the buy-in, and that's where I think is that we have had have seen success and have got you know at the partners to the table to really look at what we discussed is is a new way of doing business how we work together where police are one partner they're not the partner leading and telling other agencies what what to do because sometimes that's what you have to overcome is that belief whether that's real or not is that perception as well too so it really is about that it's about creating that if we're gonna create a new service delivery model like this, it's truly a partnership where everyone has an equal role. Right on, thank you very much. Move in. Yep. If I can just uh, offer a comment about establishing priorities, and there are many priorities that a police leader has to establish. But very often they get lost in what they've been doing as caretakers rather than what they are responsible for as leaders. The chief has to make a decision or the senior officers, including Dave uh, as a, an executive director, they have to make decisions based on what's in the public's best interest and they lose sight of that. In fact, I don't think it's difficult for many police officers, police leaders to look at what are the priorities that are facing me as an individual and the organization and what are these priorities are in the public's best interest and focus on the ones that are in the, that are in the public's best interest that the public is going to have the, the most uh, positive outcome come from and many of uh, many uh, managers uh, uh, simply uh, uh, see themselves i think as either processing the paper or uh, you know uh, protecting the status quo or you know, they, they simply have to make those priority decisions on, based on what's in the public's best interest. And I think that all of the presentations today from everyone 
uh, sort of drives that point home. Now, I don't know if we have any other questions, but I could make a couple of concluding remarks. We're at, uh, uh, I think, 16.30 Eastern time. Just before I conclude, I'll let John, uh, John has his hand. Yeah, right. I think we need to touch on Devon's uh, question here. Uh, what are your thoughts on the receptivity of the general public and special interest groups to acknowledge and support the change that they have been calling for? Is it directed at some particular uh, speaker, John? Devon? Oh, Devon. He asked it, really? but maybe he knows who he's addressed. No, no one in particular, because I do, I spend a lot of time speaking to police service executives and I can tell you everything that we're talking about here. The environment is there. You talk to any police leader, you know, whether I'm talking to police leaders in the US or in Canada, they're right here. They want exactly what we're talking about. And I'm saying there's a point in time when we have to realize the door is open. So now is a general public and the special interest groups willing to acknowledge and start to support that change and recognize that we're on the same page. Police leaders are actually on this page and it's time for us to stop saying people aren't there and say, okay, how do we all move forward now? So I'd like to hear from all of the panelists. What are your thoughts around that? I can go first if uh, I just took myself off mute. Well, listen, if uh, I pay very, very close attention to media in uh, in Canada, but also media in the U.S., and I pay very close attention to social media. And when you hear a lot of people blaming the media for what's going on, a lot of times they're actually blaming social media because that's what's, uh, uh, you know, things grow legs pretty quick. I would say, and, and I am not anti-mainstream media at all. I don't want you to take that from this. But if you listen to a lot of the mainstream media, you would you would think that, the, the battle is a lot worse than it really is but if you would live if but if you pay attention to social media and they have dedicated pages to policing reform and uh you know the special interest groups have dedicated pages i think there is a strong uh, uh i think there's a lot of support and they do recognize that and in in fact uh they will come to the uh defense of many officers who have have done wrong and and sure if the officers uh, done wrong and they deserve, uh, you know, to be punished. Of course, that's that's fine. But I would say that there's uh, there's mainstream media and social media and uh, uh, listeners, hundreds of millions of people on social media. I would think that the conversation is a lot more realistic on social media. There's some fantastic pages of uh, organizations that aren't even typically pro police, but they have a very very fair stance on a lot of things. And perhaps I can even write some of those uh, organizations down and and send them to you. Um, some of the, the, you know, the handles down. That's just my own kind of opinion. Good question. Thanks, Devin. Thank I'll you for the response. In. Yeah, I'll hop in on this one. I think it's really dependent on the community itself. I think there's some communities who are, have open arms and they're just like, we understand, like we're looking for that. And there's some where the trust has been broken over and over again. And those are the ones that they're going to need to see a little bit more action and a little bit more of the they're going to give them time it's going to be that hesitant part of the relationship where it's like all right i caught you cheating so i'm going to give you a potential second chance but i'm going to need you to prove yourself first before my trust is rebuilt with you um so sometimes just doing a community survey um, is a great way to see kind of like hey what are they looking for you could survey about specific programs or outreach campaigns and and get their feedback Thank you. Yeah, I sorry. Uh, sorry, Rick. Uh, I can go next. You know, and I just want to follow up and agree. I think we can't underestimate the importance of trust. So, Devon, to truly the community has to trust is that we're actually on a path to meaningful change. So, I know initially when we started on this project, some of the key partners that we had to deal with, they really, really trust was an issue. And that just because obviously, you know, what, like it says, again, perceptions are not. So it's overcoming those perceptions and really ensuring then that those organizations trust and that you retain that trust. Because if they're opening themselves up to trust that there's a new path forward, you, you can't abuse that either. You really have to appreciate that they're embracing that trust and move forward and always ensure that you're doing everything you can to maintain that trust. Yeah, I'll just add just a couple of points. And, and Randy, you hit this in your presentation. We all experience life in relationships. 
you know, it's, it's very rare that it is about a contract or something. And I think policing and the community are kind of the same is, is that that has been a relationship over the years that has led to, uh, as Bree said, that wait and see, I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm, I'm just maybe even slightly skeptical depending on the community. And so I think the response to that would be to re to view that as a relationship to say, what steps am I going to take towards that relationship to restore that? And part of that is engagement. Part of that is interaction. Part of that is as we would do in a relationship. You know, we say, you know, here's my intention. Here's a recognition of, of harms that, that I might have done. But my intention is to do this. And and I, I and I accept that you're going to actually watch me, maybe even skeptically for a while, but I'm going to live to those values and move forward. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I I'd just like to say a couple of things. First of all, I want to thank Levine for um, focusing the um, the presentations and the the. Uh, the summaries of each of, of the presentations. Mubin, I truly appreciate your time. I know that you're busy. Our four speakers, Rick, Randall, Bree, and Dave, um, I, I want to say a couple of things. First, uh, excellent presentations, uh, very meaningful information that many police organizations, people that are involved in police communication should know about and should, uh, maybe I can use the term replicate or should, should do something with. But the issue that we have in Canada, as you all know, is there is no central repository anywhere for good, valuable, proven information to be uh, provided to police agencies uh, to to, to seize upon, to, to, uh, to implement the gold standard, implement the best practices. Our coalition is working hard to get the police officers, uh, police governance people, uh, particularly the public, to understand the deficiencies in plain, training, uh, deficiencies in policing, but particularly the deficiencies in police entry-level training and standardize a curriculum that's current and relevant. And I see that uh, a college of policing that can act uh, as, a, as a, an organization that uh, can research and develop the best standards and have them available to police agencies is one huge step forward in what we do in Canada in policing. We're working in silos. We're working in individual organizations. We have Rick and Randy and Bree and others uh, that uh, like Dave that have excellent uh, 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 studies or experience. I mean, what, what Dave is talking about in Edmonton would be invaluable for others to just learn about, but there's no way to bring it together. So the college, uh, you know, the, the creation of national training and education standards for police officers and a college of policing to, to have a focal point for all of this is so important. So I guess all I can say in a summary from, from our perspective is the more support we have, the more uh, the public knows about why this change is necessary, uh, it, will, it will eventually move forward and someday we'll see this. Uh, you know, I would like to see Canada as a, uh, as a model uh, for police education and training and development uh, at all levels in the organization, but particularly to start at the entry level, like all other police, or I should say, like all other professions. All other professions have a degree program or an entry level program uh, that is uh, credible within their profession, whether you're a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse, but policing has fallen so far behind. And we simply can't prepare uh, our police officers for our, the complex 21st century work that they have to do with a 22 or 27 week program. So thank you very much to everyone for uh, participating today. Uh, I truly enjoyed the sessions and I'm, I'm hoping that others uh, will have gain benefit from it uh and i leave it at that if, unless we have any other comments from anyone john yes thanks dave i just add that there's a poll up and uh running just the question uh do you have any other topics just email us please at info at c-cpr.ca straight to dave's desk and would you attend a one day conference in Vancouver next year tacked on to uh, an already planned conference of two days.
So uh, that would be in early March. It's just a discussion, but uh, expressions of interest might help us uh, gel our plans. And also, thank you everybody for attending. We were peaked at 46 attendees, I believe, and the material all was really very revealing, uh, enjoyable, I learned. So uh, thank you all. Thank you.